Coming up. If you aren't relaxed, you can't do it. You just shake and fall off. A peek inside the curious world of slacklining with acrobat and insta-famous aerial yogi, Liz Thomas. Right now I have 15.8 thousand followers. I've had people approach me in Canada that were like, I do this now because I saw you post this on Instagram. How she's pushing women around the world to be unconventional. And he's won more games than any other four-year college softball coach ever. Talk, talk, talk. Coach Phil McSpadden tells us what it takes to stay on top of the record books. And Cherokee National Treasure Betty Jo Smith teaches us about authentic Cherokee cooking. There was no stores to go and get anything like that. And that's how we lived. Foraging for the food that fuels our culture and serving up a nostalgic meal to feed the family. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning, growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. Wado. OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. Today, we're running the bases with a record-breaking Hall of Fame college softball coach, and we'll forage for food and get cooking with a Cherokee national treasure. First up today, we go slacklining with aerialist Liz Thomas, Liz feels most comfortable with both her feet off the ground and has gained notoriety for taking her sport to new heights. And it's one of those things where you can't think about falling because if you think about falling, you're gonna fall. But if you just think about like the present moment and being where you are and focus on your breath, you can just take the next step. Uh, hello, my name is Liz Thomas. I am a professional slackliner. Slacklining is similar to uh, tightrope walking, but it's on a slack line opposed to a tightrope or a cable. Normally you'll see it in a park and it's like strung between two trees, but I like to do what's called highlining and you just put up a slack line in between two cliffs. Slacklining is hard. Uh, for every step, you have to balance on that foot and then you have to switch your whole body position to balance on your next foot. You have to balance on both feet and then you have to take one off and go back to the other side. And so it's, it's a lot of little things. There's a lot of breathing. I'd say most of it is your breath. It's such a mental game. I've gone through a lot of different ways to be able to kind of conquer that fear. If you aren't relaxed, you can't do it. You just shake and fall off. So I'm from Oklahoma and I did grow up in a really white suburban neighborhood in Broken Arrow and I was also in Girl Scouts and I loved playing in the dirt and I was a total tomboy and I think that just stuck with me. Um, and then I got a little older and I was in the Cherokee National Youth Choir for five years because I like to sing and I do really love my Cherokee roots. And I went to college in Colorado and started rock climbing. And the first day I came back from rock climbing, there was a slack line up and I started slack lining. And ever since then, I've been hooked. I think it took me about just less than an hour to walk across my first slack line, but that's like outrageous. Like most people, it takes some weeks. And maybe two years after that, I started being a highliner. One of my friends just was like, oh, hey, by the way, people do this in between cliffs. And I was like, no way. <laughs> why would you do that? And then now I do it all the time. You pretty much just do it because it's fun. Like, why do you do anything? Like, uh, you do it because it's fun. You have a good time. You can share it with all your friends. And the community, the slacklining and highlining community is a really good community to be a part of. They're really supportive. I remember there was just somebody who was like, oh, hey, you'd be really good at aerial silks. 
and I went to a studio and I started doing aerial silks and I was like, oh yeah, this is really fun. And then I slowly got into acro yoga and now I teach acro yoga, I teach slack lining, I teach silks and aerial yoga and all the things. I love social media. That's how I started meeting slackliners that lived in other places and other communities and states. There's things that just show up, like here's a festival in this country, come. And you're like, okay. I have gone to Mexico for a highlining festival. I've also been to Canada. I've highlined in Colorado in a couple places. There's communities all over the place and you can find them on Facebook or through friend groups and Instagram. Hello, Instagram. Right now, I'm doing this fun little photo shoot with OCO. <laughs> I'm like a micro Insta famous. I'm not like a big Insta famous person, but I'm like on the lower end of Insta famous. Right now, I have 15.8 thousand followers, and that was part of why it was so much fun going to Mexico because I met so many people who were like, oh, We've followed you for years. Will you take a selfie with me? And I was like, Yes, of course. I like still talk to loads of people or have become best friends with people through Instagram. We're here! Woo! It's nice having a presence on Instagram and showing that you can be an outdoor woman and do all these things. I set up aerial silks off of a high line and high lining in general, there's just more men who do it. Aerial silks is something where it's mostly women. And I did that, I posted some pictures on Instagram like years ago. There's so many girls who do that now and it just blows my mind and it's really cool. And like, I've had people approach me in Canada that were like, I do this now because I saw you post this on Instagram. I'm like, oh, what? And so, yeah, I, I think it is important for girls to just feel comfortable to do whatever they want. And if they want to go outside and they want to camp and they want to highline, then they can do it. I think what people can get most out of aerial yoga, slackline yoga, and acro yoga is just learning how to love themselves and learning how to play. Like it's okay to be an adult and fall on the ground a, a lot. <laughs> and I think that's, that's the one thing I wanna teach anyone and everyone is you're never too old to play. Phil McSpadden is in his 30th year coaching women's softball at Oklahoma City University. Over the years, he's won multiple national championships, shattered records, and is currently the winningest four-year college softball coach in the country. When I was in high school, girls didn't play sports. Girls were uh, on the dance team, or they were in the pep club, or they were in the band, and there were a lot of people um, that believe that a girl can't do the same thing as a guy. And uh, a lot of guys back then were thinking, girls don't have the same strength as guys. I, I guess I'm gonna disagree here. There's things that they can bring to the table that, that guys can't. You're going, okay, no, I just, I, I don't buy into this. My name is Phil McSpadden. I'm the softball coach at Oklahoma City University. I am in my 30th season here at this university, coaching women's fast pitch. Well, I was lucky enough, I inherited a talented bunch. Uh, we we're making it to the national tournament every year, but we couldn't win that title. In 94 uh, was our first national championship. You win one in 95, and you won one in 96. And then of course, the one that we won last year, um, super group. I mean, like I said, you always brag about every team, but this particular group, uh, won 67 ball games and lost three by a total of three runs. So uh, very accomplished in, in what they pulled off. My dad was Bob McSpadden. Uh, he was on Cherokee Council, I don't know for how many years. I'm very proud of Cherokee heritage. 
Even when I was little, that we lived in a house on Will Rogers Ranch there in Uliga, um, as dad worked for his dad, who obviously was Will Rogers' foreman. Will Rogers books, um, all that stuff, dad was very interested in. He was always trying to promote, you know, this is where we came from, this is who we are. Gosh, Lions Club, iBank, American Legion, Red Feather Drive, um, baseball commissioner. The baseball field in Benita is named after him. He unfortunately passed away in 2008. I never thought of myself as a coach. Never thought that's what I'd end up doing. I went off to college to play ball and majored in business. You get to do some traveling and, and suiting up, et cetera, et cetera, Roy Roberts, but didn't have a great career by any means. I couldn't throw a strike over a parking lot, and that changes everything. So I get a phone call. Hey, there's a, there's a baseball and business instructor job in Brayman, Oklahoma. And there's not even a school in Brayman anymore. But I took a job sight unseen, just, hey, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Brayman was a class B school, and I got a phone call from um, a baseball coach who was retiring at a class A school, and then that led into a, a superintendent calling me from a, you know, a bigger school, and then, and then Oklahoma City University even calling me and asking me to come talk to him about this job. I was concerned about coaching fast pitch. It's not anything from my familiar background, so if it's a different type of sport, can I even do this? I remember going to the first practice when I was at Dewey, and I was asking the infielders, okay, why are you guys so close to the plate? I mean, tell me what's going on here. Um, big time learning. And, and so you're, you're, like I said, you're talking to dads, you're talking to girls, and you're learning out the things that are the same. And then you thought, well, it's still a bat and ball game. And the coach that was there was the men's and women's basketball coach for like 30 years at Welch, Oklahoma. I mean, very well respected. Coach, okay, not that familiar with coaching girls. And he just said, you coach them just like guys, you just don't pat them on the butt. And, and I thought that was the best advice you could get. I'm competitive, and I always have been. But it, it's the people that you work with. You want to win it for them. I mean, he'll call timeout in practice five times about one situation just to get everything perfectly right. I think that's what makes him so successful in what he does. Off of the field, he would do anything for you. No matter what, you could be right or wrong, but he will back you 100%, no matter what. Like, he does the lines, chalk lines, and does everything before the game. He will literally get on his hands and knees and blow on the bases to make sure they're dry from spray paint. He's that particular. I've never said I'm, I'm a parent for anybody. I like to think maybe I'm an uncle and I've got a vested interest in you and a, and a concern. I want, to, I want them to have fun, so it's not the records, it's just the joy. Did you enjoy your four years here? The girls are playing for each other, and they're playing for the love, and they don't look at professionalism even a part of the formula. So you just appreciate the why compared to maybe a lot of guys. You know, I don't want to live in a make-believe world. I, I want to believe that I've, they have fond memories that a large, portion of your kids appreciate you as a person and what you're trying to do. And I had a great conversation with a catcher that, gosh, goes back years, and she's a policeman. I couldn't, I couldn't do my job if it wasn't playing for you. I mean, there's things that I deal with every day that I'm going, it's not nearly as tough as playing for Miss Patton. And she was saying it as a, as a compliment, and you're going, is that a compliment? Um, um, so so you, you want to believe that, and, and it makes you keep on going, but you'd never know. You can think you're all this, and you can be wealthy, and you can have a great reputation, but the size of your funeral is still going to be based on the weather. I mean, I, I thank God for, I thank God for a lot of things, but I'm, I'm not foolish enough to not think that he had a big hand in giving me a pretty good life. Tahlequah, October 25th, 1849. Be it enacted by the National Council that the Principal Chief be, and he is hereby authorized to have procured and forwarded a suitable block of Cherokee marble to the Washington Monument Association, Washington, D.C., as an offering from the Cherokee Nation. 
approved John Ross. The Washington Monument is the nation's memorial to its first president, George Washington. Construction of the Washington Monument began on the National Mall in 1848, but because of funding problems, construction stopped and the monument sat unfinished for almost 25 years. Along the way, as, as a means of fundraising, the organization which first conceived of and started the construction of the Washington Monument was the Washington National Monument Society. And to raise funds, they solicited uh, an, an idea where states, organizations, foreign countries, notable individuals could donate a commemorative stone that would be placed in the walls of the monument. And of course, to place that stone, they also asked that you send a, a monetary donation that would help with the construction. The monument opened in 1888, and today there are 193 commemorative stones in its walls. The commemorative stones are a fascinating story of mid-19th century America. Uh, there are many stones from the Masons, from all these uh, fraternal organizations, which were very big in the middle of the part of the 19th century and have, have sort of sort of died off. This is the international level. All the stones on this level came from outside of the United States, present-day Switzerland, Bremen, Germany, Turkey, Greece, Thailand. On the 220-foot level is the stone from the Cherokee Nation. The Cherokee Nation stone is very simple in its, its design. Uh, it's simply the name Cherokee Nation uh, and the year on it. It's absent many of the, the, the quotes or the ornate engravings and carvings that we see on a lot of the other stones. It's one of three stones uh, that are, are in, the, in the walls today that, that have come from Native American organizations. Um, we passed the Anacostia tribe stone earlier. Tuscarora Nation also has one. The Cherokee stone was given in 1850, but the Park Service does not have a record of where exactly it came from or how it got to Washington, D.C. The history of the Washington Monument stones written shortly after the arrival of the, the stone indicates that the Cher Cherokee Nation has presented a block of white marble, uh, when in fact, it's actually made of limestone. 1850, you're less than 20 years removed from the, the Trail of Tears. Um, and I would like to think that, that perhaps it says something about um, what the Cherokee people thought of, of George Washington. Over the years, many have speculated the Cherokee Nation commemorative stone was carved from the quarries in present-day Marble City in the Cherokee Nation. However, that quarry did not start operating until the late 1800s. This article from a 1910 Muldrow Press newspaper claims the stone was carved from the Bayou Menard Mountains at Fort Gibson. But with no real documentation, the stone's source may forever remain a mystery. Let's talk Cherokee. I don't like this. I like this. Did you make this? Nihis Joslana hea. Nihi Joslana hea. I want to buy it. Aguaduli Akiwahisti. Cherokee artists showcase their crafts to visitors from around the world at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. The Cherokee Nation, United Katua Band, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians partner for the annual Cherokee Days event which celebrates the shared history and heritage of the Cherokee people. Cherokee Days opens a new market for Cherokee national treasures, artists, and artisans to sell their art, and some have even secured fellowships and other opportunities along the way. All in all, Cherokee Days is a way to advance Cherokee art and culture across the globe. The Cherokee Nation once again handed out millions of dollars to Oklahoma public schools. It's part of our annual Public School Appreciation Day, funded by the sale of Cherokee Nation tribal car tags. This year, the tribe awarded $5 million to superintendents from about 100 public school districts. For the first time since the Cherokee Nation car tags went statewide, donations were also distributed to schools just outside the tribal boundaries. The districts can use the money however they want, with many using it to offset state budget cuts.
And you know, this is one of the greatest days we have during the year, and I am so proud and appreciative of the Cherokee Nation because they put ed public education as a priority. Since 2002, the tribe has awarded more than $45 million to public schools as part of this program. Cherokee Nation Cultural Tourism is offering an exclusive chartered coach tour exploring the historic Cahokia Mounds near St. Louis, Missouri. Once a hub of trade and commerce between tribal communities, it's one of the largest ancient cities in North America. Discover hundreds of years of Native American traditions, culture, and history. Cherokee interpretive guides will share extraordinary true stories and historic events right where they happened. The Cahokia Mounds Tour departs September 26th and returns September 29th. For more information, go to visitcherokeenation.com. For more Cherokee Nation news, visit onadiscoe.com or go to oco.tv and click on links mentioned. Cherokee National Treasure Betty Jo Smith grew up cooking for her large family in the Cherokee Nation. Today, she passes those cooking skills on to newer generations and shared an authentically Cherokee meal with us. I just, I guess I just like cooking because uh, somebody had to fix a meal. When I was growing up, there was no stores to go and get anything like that. And that's how we lived. And everybody tells me, well, how did you manage? I said, you manage. I'm Betty Jo Smith, and I'm a Cherokee National cook, authentic cooking. It's a little bit tall, some of it is, and you, you get the smaller ones, they're better tasting. So you want us to get the small ones? Yeah, get the smaller ones. Okay. I was born in a little log cabin. There was no medical people around, so my aunt had to be the midwife. So I was born in the woods, <laughs> more or less so. Well, that's good, those are a little bit tender. I just barely remember when we were moving to uh, Shalako. They had a homestead there, and that's where we moved, and was raised mostly there. It was bare country. My father farmed on the land. They, they support everything. It was called a homestead. And we had a two-room house. So my mother took care of the house. Wait, now that's a mess. That's good. That's plenty. It smell good. Very good. Very good, very good. Very nice and tender. And I had to do most of the caretaking after my mother got sick. So with learning to cook, she would explain to us what she liked and how to fix it. And then when we would go to church, I'd follow the uh, elders around, learning from them. So I began picking up this and that from everyone. Where we lived, there was a lot of watercress and poke things like that. Come down here, Dundee. Late spring. And get the watercress, because it's good on sandwiches. Got married in 49, and then we moved to Hulbert. It was an old log frame house. Lived in it for years till we had the house built. We raised six girls and five boys. We're going to show Grandma what we got. See if it's, we get her approval. Oh, yeah, that's just fine. Okay. That's great. We gather it, boil it, and then pour the water out, and just put it in a skillet of a little oil, and then add your eggs to it. But it's delicious. I taught my kids, you know, when they make dumplings, you don't make them thick. You make them kind of narrow so you can have the broth with it. And in our time, we didn't have measuring spoons or anything like that. A speck of this, a speck of that. And we uh, used to go out in the woods and get the wild grape dumplings. 
They are the best tasting man. John Lake Village was known then when I worked there. I worked there 27 years, I believe. Started bringing our children in. So I was with some of my children all out during that time. And they got to work in there. They got to learn weaving baskets, bow, bow making, arrowhead making. So they worked there about as long as I did. Kind of reminded me of how I was growing up because that was easy to do. Of course, you didn't get to cook in there or anything. You had to have a fire and doing your work. When you raise them in the garden and they start big enough to snap, they're real easy. These hair are kind of aged a little bit. They're kind of tough, but you can still do it. We did a lot of cooking outside a long time ago when we was growing up. Mom taught me how. I watched Mom, and I used to get up and watch her make bread all the time. They all are. It's going to be around to help me. I owe them with everything I know. That's all I can say. Morris, I'm proud of my kids and what they're doing. I enjoy giving my secrets, my food. <laughs> I don't want them to forget that. Coming up next time on OCO Voices of the Cherokee People. Growing up on her family's Cherokee allotment in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, Amy Staten never rode a horse. So when she decided to become a professional jouster, this Cherokee Nation citizen learned to ride the hard way, in armor and holding a 10-foot lance. Watch for her story and much more on the next episode of OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye. We say, dododago ha'i. We'll see each other again. So until next time, wado.